Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope that uh, everyone is enjoying this so far. Uh, for me and for my co-chairs, Tom Scarangello and uh, Charlie Murphy, this is a, this is a dream come, come true. And uh, with, the, uh, with all of the help and with all of the hard work by the uh, Building Congress staff. Uh, today, I have uh, the great pleasure of introducing someone who I regard as one of the most remarkable people in the architectural profession. Um, and someone with whom I've been privileged to collaborate with. Uh, that's Phil Bernstein, Associate Dean at Yale. Uh, you see, Phil and I once put our, our jobs and our careers on the line uh, because we believed in change. We believed in this thing called building information modeling. And we believed that projects, both small and large, could effectively be designed and implemented using this building modeling uh, environment. And so we convinced our respective organizations to use a new application to model, model a large project. Um, that new application was Revit, and that uh, project was One World Trade Center. The, uh, the tears and buckets of sweat that our teams put into, uh, into that effort conclusively demonstrated to the industry that there was no project too large, too complex, that could not be successfully implemented in the BIM environment. Uh, one of my favorite sources for uh, 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 business uh, development knowledge or business management knowledge uh, is Carl von Clausewitz. And um, von Clausewitz wrote that no great commander ever achieves success without audacity. Phil displayed great audacity and he made it happen. Phil's work and his lectures are filled with poetry, insight, but most of all, optimism. The messages have evolved over the years, but the central theme remains the same, that we could do better, we should do better, and we will be better if we just think clearly and objectively and conceive of ways to maximize the use of technology in integrating the AEC industry. Phil has shaped the profession of architecture and related professions in so many ways. As a practitioner responsible for the implementation of major projects, as a leader in the AIA, as a visionary and innovator in the use of technology, and as a highly respected educator. I know no one who better exemplifies the famous quote, the best way to predict the future is to create it. We're all in for a great treat with this presentation and let's all welcome Phil Bernstein. Thanks, Carl. Well, gosh, after that, I think I'll just sit down and let that little talk do. And um, I, I've completely forgotten that we had risked our respective careers on that project. It's, you know, you never know what's going to happen when, um, when you are uh, sitting next to a, co a professional colleague on an airplane and you cook up an idea that you're going to use a brand new technology on the world's most important project. But I think it worked out well. Um, so today, when Carl and his team called me, they asked me to um, talk a little bit about some of my thoughts about the relationship between technology and innovation. And I think that's um, a lot of what you've been hearing today. But I'm going to try to take the conversation actually in a slightly different direction. Um, as Carl mentioned, I've, I've had sort of three parts in my career. I was a practitioner for a while, then um, I was a vendor, right? I worked for Autodesk for a while, and now I'm a full-time academic. And during that whole the, whole, the whole course of my career, the thing I've really been interested in is not so much technology, but the relationship between technology and how people in the building industry actually operate. What, how, does, how does technology affect the, the relationships between the players, the risk and return values, the value propositions, and the financial dynamics. And as I'll argue during this discussion today, a conversation about technology in and of itself that doesn't include that part of the discussion about how we actually change the underlying processes, is, it's not just incomplete, it's uninteresting. And so I, I want to set a little bit of a context first here. And I've, I've um, over the course of my career, I've I've worked on this and I've worked on this and I've got the entire history of AEC technology down into two slides. So I can do the whole history of technology in two slides now, right? So um, for the first 
X thousands of years, we drew stuff, right? Information was transmitted on two-dimensional drawings. Um, my former colleague at Yale, Mario Carpo, who, um, who writes a lot on the history of representation, talks about drawing as a CPU management strategy. That a, drawing, a drawing is actually a way of transmitting information or CPU cycles really, really quickly because it's, it's an abstraction approach, right? And so we did that for several thousand years. Then we went through a brief, relatively speaking, interstice where we translated drawings into computer-aided drafting and we used computers to make drawings. So it wasn't all that interesting. We drew our lines and our arcs and our circles using computers instead of using um, using instruments, rendering the skills, of course, of a whole generation of baby boomer architects like myself and Carl completely useless, of course. Um, but that, that period all lasted for a very short, fairly short period of time. Then we got into the building information modeling age, as Carl mentioned, and that was a disruptive shift because building information modeling represented a paradigmatic change in the way we represent information in the building industry. Instead of abstract diagrams and two-dimensional projections, a building information model, in theory, is a parametrically dynamic, informationally rich, behaviorally provocative demonstration, pre-demonstration of a building built digitally before the building is actually built um, physically, or at least that was the assertion. And then you overlay onto that the technologies that Rick talked about this morning, cloud computing, which creates an infinite number of um, compute cycles. You know, co computation and representation in our industry was constrained by the, by the power of the computers that we could afford on our desks. But now that building information modeling is BIM, and it, or BIM is cloud enabled, you can pretty much process as much information as you want. And in, in, at the same time, internet connectivity is to the point where you can deliver any of that information any place to the point of work. So any place in the building enterprise, you can take a piece of high resolution information and distribute it. So what I'm gonna suggest is that means there's something else that I'm gonna call connected BIM, which is the fourth generation of technologies in our industry. That now there's a tremendous amount of data. I, I love the comment earlier that uh, data is the new oil, but it's crude oil. So this is the kind of early uh, diagram of the refinery here where information is now highly fluid, it's high resolution, you can move it anywhere, and it's, it's kind of interconnected. And so on top of that, you start saying, well, what does this mean for our industry in terms of the potential of this new technology and moving things forward? So our friends from McKinsey, as I'm sure KP's been watching this very carefully, our friends from McKinsey have recently gotten really interested in the building industry, and they've started writing reports about it. And what, when McKinsey starts writing reports about an industry it means two things. One, in this particular case, they've run out of other industries to write reports about, <laughs> right? And two, there's about to be a bunch of money coming into the building industry for technological innovation. And God knows that we certainly need it. If you look at the chart on these charts map, McKinsey's analysis of productivity growth against uh, computational implementation, digitization. So the farther you are on the right, the more digitized you are. The higher you are on the left, the more productive you are. And as you can imagine, construction in both the US and Europe has low degrees of computational implementation and low degrees of productivity. And so the, you know, the economist Robert Solow, I think in 1990, had that famous quote, you can see the computers everywhere except in the productivity statistics. And it's been almost 30 years, and that's still true in our industry. So there's a tremendous amount of potential to actually move computation forward. And also, I think you're gonna see a lot of, frankly, a lot of investment in, in the kinds of companies that, um, that Pat was talking about and the, the panel before us were talking about. And so they're gonna be a, a wave of these different kinds of technologies, most of which have been mentioned in one form or another during the course of the day today. Big data, of course, is gonna be, a, a, a wave of big data is gonna wash over our industry, I think. This is a, a, an analytical tool built by my faculty colleague and her team, uh, Anna Dyson who was formerly at RPI and is now at Yale. It's called SEVA that she uses to aggregate 350 different data streams that she uses to do building analysis. This is a kind of, this is one of those death by a thousand dashboards, but this is a really cool dashboard. So there's this sort of big data thing happening. There's computational design, which is the ability to write an algorithm that generates an answer instead of having to directly manipulate 
as a designer and answer and using a computational or an algorithmic strategy to solve a problem. There's um, the combination of computation and analytics to define a set of strategies that examine, a pro examine the uh, behavior of a project. This is some work done by David Benjamin and his firm called The Living, which is part of the Autodesk's office of the CTO. They did this work to design a new office building that's actually in Toronto, where they built a series of algorithms designed to optimize these eight characteristics of the design, and then they computationally generated a series of options to try to understand what the best answer was for the design problem. So you can see the design proposition here, and these principles apply in construction as well, moving from direct manipulation, judgment, intuition, to algorithmic and data-driven strategies, which are actually quite interesting. Then you lay on top of that the whole discussion that we just saw about sensors, which is the ability to collect information and understand the dynamics of what's happening literally in the field, not only in order to see what is, uh, how a given system is performing, but to aggregate knowledge about how that system is performing over time. This is our, these are our friends Kieran Timberlake in Philadelphia. They build these little sensors themselves out of Raspberry Pis in their basement, and they will go out when they're doing a building renovation, sensor up the building, measure its thermal performance, then come back to the client and say, when we're done, the building's gonna do X. Then they put the sensors on the building, and they measure it, and they, get, they say to the client, we accomplished X, we measured it. And this theme of measurement, which is, the, and you've, you've heard it consistently all morning long here, this idea that things are starting to get measured in the building industry is a really profound, really profound concept, but it's gonna be profound for reasons that I hope you'll find are interesting and different. And then there's this whole question of uh, what, um, what um, Rick called, what I, he called design and construction technology, I'll call it industrialized construction which is using techniques of, the, of industrial production to build buildings, whether it's this crazy Swiss terracotta printing robot. I assume there's a guy in the truck eating a sandwich um, while this robot is building this building, or the combination of uh, robotic strategies and the use of artificial intelligence. This is a research project done by Autodesk where a robot was teaching itself to build things out of Legos, it was just given a few simple rules about picking things up and snapping things, and by using infinite computing power, it worked its way through the problem until it finally figured out how to th assemble things in Legos. So you not only have the ability to do things in an automated way, the machines can teach themselves to do stuff that creates a series of logics that are then available um, in the construction industry. And, the, and that kind of logic is interesting not only because it's an optimization strategy, but it also creates a circumstance where construction logic itself becomes available a priori to the design process. So this is an algorithm that tests crane positions and um, other kinds of equipment locations to optimize the construction strategy for a precast building. The difference is this analysis is being run by the designers, so the configuration of the building can be, can be affected by the construction strategy for the building. So what you're starting to see is that some of that crude oil, that data that was talked about earlier, creating a, a series of loops of insight that, that create a different set of opportunities for the design, construction, and ultimately the operation of a building. And so I think the implication of this is a really interesting and profound one, and, it's, and it gives us a way to think about how technology is gonna actually change the processes in the building industry, because by virtue of being able to do all this measurement and use all this data, we can, and, and apply those principles in these simulations, which are models, we can start to predict stuff. We can begin to predict things that are gonna happen. And a lot of what you've heard on this stage today, uh, pa passing mentions to our risk aversion as an industry, our inability to understand the implications of the decisions that we make, our unwillingness to understand what the, what the risk implications are. This is, a, um, this is a set of potential ideas that allow us to attack that problem in a different kind of way. And what you see here on the left and right is some data that I got from my colleagues at WeWork a few years ago where they were using the information that they had aggregated from the uses of their spaces and then they hired a bunch of human designers to predict conference room use in a new facility, and then they used an artificial intelligence algorithm to do the same prediction, and of course the artificial intelligence algorithm 
which used a bunch of very simple data, like we have, this, we have these demographics, we need these conference rooms, was a much more effective way of doing things. So we have all this, this is a theme of the day, as, as it seems to me, we have all this potential of technology into which we enter into a context where there's all this stuff going on. There's labor shortages and industrialized construction and new kinds of materials and all the kinds of startups that are in Pat's lab and uh, opportunities to change the crude oil of big data into actual something actually refined, but no clear business processes for how we're gonna attack that. I would argue that despite the career risking move that Carl and I made, back in whatever it was, 2004 or 2005, the potential of BIM is largely unrealized, particularly here in New York, where it's basically used to crank out better working drawings. Uh, and then, of course, there are the whole sort of New York City energy issues. And so uh, last year, I finished a book where I was trying to explore some of these questions, um, the book called Architecture, Design, Data, Practice, Competency in the Era of Computation. And I was really exploring three questions in this book. One. What's the agency of the players in the project delivery process and how do they relate to one another in a context where this technology has all kinds of potential? Two, what, how does the technology change their methodology? What kinds of new things could be done by the players in the building process if they took advantage of the kinds of technologies that we've just looked at? And three, how does that change the value proposition? Because without a change in the basic structure of project delivery models, the value propositions, the risk exchanges, the profit exchanges in the systems of delivery, you have a lot of unrealized potential in all of these kinds of technologies. And so that's really what I want to spend the rest of the time talking about here. And so what I suggested in my book was that there's an actually a future state where these things might be radically shifted, but they have to shift in parallel, in concert with one another, that instead of, um, Instead of pr professional agency being this idea where architects and engineers do this bizarre thing called describe design intent, and the way do they do that is by multiply iterating things until they get it right, and then they are, their services are purchased by virtue of their lowest first cost, which in other words means lowest fee, right? Low, that's, that's the purchase strategy. In the future state, intent gets translated to a different idea, which I'm gonna call execution and information control that your, your design intent becomes an exercise in creating a context in which a predictable outcome is actually going to happen, and that your methodology is no longer in, entirely reliant on your experience and your intu intuition, but you can use these tools for the systematic exploration of problems, analysis, simulation, testing, and predictive conclusions. That you can actually predict what's gonna happen, so you can make a promise about what's gonna happen. And so the value proposition that underlies the building industry could make a radical shift. And that radical shift would be from lowest first costs, commodified, commodified procurement to outcome-based procurement. I'm gonna let that sink in for a minute, right? I can't, I'm not gonna speak for my colleagues who are engineers or contractors here, but I will speak for the architects. We are super good at promising stuff that we cannot deliver. <laughs> I promise you, that this is gonna happen with your building. That when we finish this building, you will continue to produce the most wonderful newspaper in the entire world, and you will be the center of the information universe, and blah, 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 but the fee's based on lowest first cost, right? It's a fixed fee. It has absolutely nothing to do with the outcomes. The only outcomes are if you screwed up, you don't get the next job. It's not really a very smart business structure. So what I wanna, what I wanna do in my last couple minutes here as instructed by the committee, the, the, the committee is put a couple of provocations in front of you that might move us in this particular direction. So here's project provocation number one. Drawing-based deliverables should be dead and replaced by digital information. We should no longer use drawings as the primary vector for our work. So here's a drawing on the left. It was uh, it's my favorite hand drawing by Robert Smithson from 1499. It's called A Round Window in a Round Wall. It's a round um, rose window that's in a curving wall, so it's a complex curve. That's it, that's the entire drawing he had to do in 1499. Built the whole thing. Carl, how many shop drawings would it take to do that, that window today? More than 100 shop drawings. Meanwhile, on the right is a shop drawing from the top of the Petronas Tower in Kuala Lumpur, which is a Caesar Pelli project that I was present for. This shop drawing was a CAD drawing that was copied in AutoCAD from a working drawing produced by a set of associate architects in Kuala Lumpur who copied it by hand from design development documents that we did in New Haven. 
So the real energy and money that was made producing this drawing was from FedEx because we were drawing things in AutoCAD, plotting them on pieces of paper, rolling them in tubes, and shipping them around the world. So this, this kind of construct makes no sense. What makes much more sense is to start to use the kinds of strategies that my former student and the former senior BIM leader at Skanska on LaGuardia Airport used when he was managing the process for distributing information on the airport, which was heavily three-dimensional. The two-dimensional was meant for um, exculpatory documentation, that means covering your ass in case there's a lawsuit. But the actual work was the transmission of three-dimensional information, digital and otherwise. And at the same time that Pierce was moving that digital information, three-dimensional information to, to move his project forward, he was simultaneously managing the data flows of the project. So he was controlling the data flows and distributing the information in three dimensions and thereby creating a different kind of set of value relationships in the overall process. Similarly, the kinds of analytical tools that make it possible to think very, in a very forward way about how a project's gonna operate are becoming more and more sophisticated. I mean, at the same time, we have the kinds of tools that were described in the last panel. This is a company here in the greater New York area called Impact Infrastructure. Does very, they do very sophisticated um, triple bottom line economic analysis of large scale projects. So they will tell you not only what the sustainability implications of your project are, but they have a jillion economists who've built a bunch of algorithms who will be able to tell you what the financial implications are as well. So that's an even more direct connection to a value proposition that's about driving an outcome, an actual result, rather than simply providing a commoditized service, which is a bunch of drawings that get pushed around by FedEx. And so my argument was, in the book, essentially said that and it was similar to a couple of the arguments that I think Rick was making earlier this morning, that the design proposition, and particularly a design proposition that is a function of simulation and outcomes, becomes an exercise in understanding the systemic relationships between the various characteristics of the entire building. And you know, I'm suddenly, as I'm looking at this diagram which I drew last year for my book, I'm realizing that this slide probably should have been in, um, in Rick's deck, right? Because this is what he's. This is essentially what he's saying that they are they are looking at costs and economics and energy and traffic and carbon and they're trying to understand the relationship systemically between all of those things across the project enterprise. And my my argument is that that this diagram itself represents the potential neural network for an outcome-based strategy for the building industry itself. So secondly, this. Even though we've, if we can turn this crude oil into something more refined, the, the incomplete nature of project information exchanges, which creates so much friction in the process and risk, is only going to be resolved if we, re, we reformulate the relationships of risk and return in the building industry. We're going to have to actually restructure things in a fundamentally different way. And there are lots of sources of inspiration for this. This is one of my favorite. So this is a report that I'm sure some of you have seen from um, the AIA, AGC, Autodesk, and a couple of other folks did this report in 2014 called Managing Uncertainty in Design and Construction. And it was a survey of owners and contractors about the kinds of things that generate problems in the building industry. And here's what was interesting about it. That stack of stuff on the right hand side, on the left hand side there, that's what everyone agrees are the problems of, of construction, right? Blah, blah. I mean, I don't have to read this list to you guys. You've seen this movie before. Unforeseen conditions, the owner changes his or her mind, design errors, accelerated schedules, blah, blah, blah. Everybody reached a quick consensus about what the pathology was. But what no one could agree on is whose fault it was. So look at uh, design omissions. The owners and the contractors both agree that that's the second most terrible problem in the building industry. The architects thought it was number seven, right? <laughs> so we got this whole kind of, um, we're all watching the same playoff game and no one can agree on what the score is, right? And so the, the, this, this, what this suggests is that there's a, there's a kind of fundamental misalignment in the value propositions and the risk exchanges that we, it doesn't matter how much technology we have, how fancy a model we make, how much analysis and simulation we do, it's, th things are still gonna be kind of structurally broken. And this evolution, this is a diagram I used in my book and with my students that describes the kind of historical evolution of different kinds of project delivery models. The pro project delivery model evolutions from hard bid to construction management to design build to IPD, are, are largely exercises in tuning the same car. 
And then what we really need to do is think about a structural way of refactoring the business models that we use to deliver in the building industry. And that's the only way we're going to ultimately realize the value of these technologies as a way of getting to the kinds of performative, sustainable, reasonable outcomes that we've been talking about all, all morning. So I want to put a couple of provocations in front of you so you might think about this in a different way. Okay, so first, the disclaimer. My students are constantly accusing me of drawing meaningless curves. I, I'll draw, just draw a curve on, a, on, on the board and then we'll try to fill in the chart. But here's what this curve means. It, it, this curve is saying, I, I, I'm teaching this course right now I'd call it alternative value propositions. And my students have to study the business models of the building industry and prepare new business models that all only have to adhere to one principle. You can't be paid on an hourly rate basis or lump sum fee. You have to generate your value in some other way. Doesn't matter what it is, but it's gotta be something else. So either we're doing fundamental research or I'm creating a generation of terrorists that are gonna come and tear your buildings up. I don't know, your firms up, I don't know which. But one of the discussions we have is, is risk of value proposition, is assuming risk of value proposition. So I said, well, okay, since owners are interested in, in reducing the risk, meaning the, the difference between what they thought they were gonna get and what they actually get on a project, then risk is a value, driving risk is a value proposition. And doing things, the more risk you take on, the more value you can drive. And maybe there's one way to look at it is say, well, there's three basic strategies here. Strat risk mitigation strategy number one is do less stupid things, right? Do, the, do a better job of what the clients expect us to do. You know, the drawings are more accurate, they're less, co they're less coordination errors, they're done on time, blah, blah, blah. Then there's a middle ground that's kind of interesting, which I'm gonna call anticipating and reducing manageable risk, which is stepping up to the things we think we could immediately control. And then the last one is what I'm gonna call embracing risk, which is doing crazy things that no one in this room would be willing to do right now because they, they generate so much value, but they're incredibly scary and we've been told for a long time. So here's some examples, right? So we could make less mistakes in the mitigate zone. We could work together to integrate trade coordination, which creates all kinds of problems in the field. We could work, do a better job predicting costs. We could accelerate schedules in the embrace zone. We could anticipate some of those owner changes and maybe take responsibility for some of that stuff. I said to an architectural colleague recently when I showed him this thinking, you know, chain, two and a half percent change orders on owner changes, what, what, what would you do if I, what, what would you have to do to guarantee that none of that happened? And he said, there's no way I would ever do that. That's way too scary. I said, what was your fee on this job? Like four and a half or five percent? If you kept two of those two and a half points, I just increased your profit margin by 70 percent. Are you interested now? And now they're, you yeah, know, okay. At least they're willing to have the conversation about it. But ultimately, and in the interest of time, I'm gonna move forward to this argument. Ultimately, at the top of this risk value curve is this idea of predicting project outcomes. It's saying to the client, you wanna do X with your building? Let's see if we can do X with the building. So the, the new value propositions that will realize the possibilities of this technology are, are project delivery models that are no longer based on commoditized value exchanges but are instead based on outcomes. We need to go to a project delivery strategy or a project delivery system that is outcome based, not commodity based. And there are excellent reasons for this. Brian, here's your chart. Brian Kennett, my colleague from Mansion is here. This is Brian's chart in my book where we talk about the, the profit margins, the various profit margin horizons where in the AEC industry, under 10% under is not, that's not, that's kind of terrible, and above 25% is extraordinary. I gotta tell you, when I was in the technology business, any number on this slide would have gotten me fired. Any number on this slide would have gotten me fired. That our, bill, our industry simply does not deliver enough value to create large enough margins. And so the thesis here is, if we can begin correlating, making things happen as a value proposition, we can break away from these kinds of, these kinds of strictures. And it, the, the, the technological possibilities of this are really, really profound. I mean, on the left are the, are, you know, the way um, predictions used to be made in my generation as a baby boomer training as an architect in the 1980s, you know, where we learned formulas on the right is how prediction is done today with uh, artificially, enabled, or artificially intelligence enabled, big data generated, highly precise predictive algorithms that can start to do the sorts of things that I'm talking about. 
And so the, what the, this, this has profound philosophical impl implications if you buy my argument. And if, if, if we were able to actually do this, I don't believe that anyone in this room would be willing to or frankly capable of starting in the right-hand side of my equation. This is kind of like you, we're going to have to go to the outcome-based uh, gym and do some calisthenics and learn how to do some of this stuff and build some credibility in the system before we can get to the, to the, the highest level aspirations. But I did create this taxonomy that says, there are, these kinds of four, there are kind of four levels of how these outcomes might work. At the bottom of the pyramid is the boring kind of transactional stuff. But at the top of the pyramid are the aspirations that clients have for building buildings. And what we can do slowly is build our credibility in the industry by starting to drive a series of outcomes that start on the left-hand side of my equation lower left-hand side of my equation and work their way up to the upper right-hand side. And that those, out, those strategies are entirely dependent not only on new kinds of business models, but new ways of collaborating between the players. That if they're not new collaboration approaches, none of this stuff is gonna work. No one in the, in the building industry delivery model can do what I'm talking about by themselves. And so the designers can do, can operate at the low level of the outcome continuum by just doing a better job with their work, delivering work on time, meeting the brief, meeting schedule and quality objectives. But once we've added together the designers and the builders, we can start to get up, up my pyramid to the next level, to what, I'm call, what I call technical performance, where the building, is a, the building project as a whole conforms to its budget, it meets the schedule because those two players can control those things, it can be designed to spec. And the next step up the whoops the, the next step up the ladder is what I'm calling operating performance, which is what the whole panel was talking about before, right? Does the building behave operationally the way we asserted it was going to behave? Does it save energy? Is the staff optimized? Is it properly maintained? Does it produce the amount of carbon? But aspirationally, this is where we want to go. Where we want to go is a place where we can actually say to clients, the thing that you signed up to do when you built this building is what we are going to deliver as a team. Our clients don't build buildings for the sake of building buildings. They build buildings for the sake of doing stuff, making people healthier, employee satisfaction, get, raising test scores, you know, lowering infection rates in the hospitals, you name whatever is the outcome is. Our clients do not build buildings in order to stay in those blue boxes. They want to be in that orange box. And so I think the, one of the best examples of this as I close is our friends in Boston uh, from uh, the firm called Mass Design. They started designing hospitals in Kigali. They work with partners in health. And they are very interested in this kind of outcome-based strategy. And if you don't know this firm, I'd, I'd, I'd suggest you get to know them. And what Alan Rick says is, we have to show that good design delivers on the core mission of our partners. It's quantifiable, reducing infections, making recovery times faster, and increasing staff retention. And so, I, I think there are some early exemplars of these kinds of firms out there. The technology is certainly capable. I think the particular challenge, and I'll, I'll make this my concluding remark, the particular challenge here in New York is that New York has the most bizarre ratio of technical sophistication to project delivery innovation of any place in the United States. I mean, the, in the, and the ratio is frankly flipped in, in, a, in a place like San Francisco. You know, a tremendous number of very sophisticated architects, engineers, subcontractors, clients here with very, very unsophisticated ideas about project delivery innovation. And in, on the West Coast, where they're eight or nine years ahead of this, maybe the firms aren't quite so fancy or so famous or doing such big projects, but they're experimenting like crazy with new ways of delivering stuff. So if I left you with any message today, it would be to try to work on that denominator a little bit and get up, get up to um, an idea around measurement and try to go to look at a scenario that goes that is more about project outcomes. Um, there's a really interesting paper written in 1990 um, by a guy named Paul David called The Dynamo and the Computer. And he was comparing the implementation of electri electric dynamos when they replaced steam engines in modern factories with uh, dynamos, which basically replaced steam with electricity. And in steam, in order to distribute work in a steam-powered factory, you had this giant drive shaft that ran through the whole factory, and you had to connect to the drive shaft to make all your machines work. And when they flipped to electric dynamos, the whole organization of American production changed. 
The architecture changed, the business models changed, the way they organized production itself changed, and we need to make that same shift. The digital information is the dynamo of the, of the 21st century for the building industry, and we need to make those kinds of shifts, and these models, in my view, are the sorts of things we should think about doing. So with that, I will finish, and I guess it's lunchtime, is that right? No? No, wait, we have another panel. Great, thank you.